Hello and welcome to our weekly credit chat that we host every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on Twitter and on Blab. Super excited today because we have Ginger. She is here. She's the founder of Girls Just Want to Have Funds. We also have Paul Moyer, who is the founder of Saving Freak. You're now like a veteran, Paul, of our hey, credit uh, chat. I keep, I keep having me back here. I keep getting shocked. I haven't said anything too offensive yet. So. <laughs> and of course, we always have Rod Griffin here. Who's our director of public education? How's everybody doing this today? Doing good. Good, good, good. Awesome. good. Well, the holiday has come upon us. I know a lot of us are doing shopping. Paul, you had mentioned last time you were in our chat, we we're talking about Thanksgiving and the Black Friday sales. How did your shopping go? Uh, pretty well. I didn't get out as much as I wanted. But one of my children got sick on Thanksgiving Day, so he and I stood oh, stayed man. home while my wife headed to her family for a Thanksgiving dinner, but I did get some turkey. Uh, luckily, most of the things, most of the Black Friday stuff is now online, so everything I wanted to get, I got, but I didn't pick up any extra little random stocking stuffers or anything like that this year. So, you know, it is what it is, parenting. Yeah. <laughs> Ginger, how's your shopping going this holiday? Oh, I stayed far away from that this year. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to brave any stores or anything like that, but you know, I just stayed away from it. Rod, are you doing any shopping? Uh, despite my best efforts to not go out on Black Friday, I still did a little bit. So <laughs> we got the Thanksgiving Day. Here's what we want for Christmas from our grandkids. <laughs> I went, oh, um, there's some things on sale that we actually want to get them in the list. And away we went. So went later, though. We didn't do the four in the morning silliness. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's not much of that left anymore. They've, they've kind of pushed it to 6 a.m. or they're open on Thanksgiving Day. So it's yeah, kind of it's. It's insane. They've tamed, but, it, they've tamed it down compared to what it used to be, though. So. Uh, so today's talk, we're talking about emotional spending. And just excited you guys have joined us. For those that are joining us on Blab, we want to welcome you and thank you for, for joining us here. If you guys have any questions for Ginger or Paul, please put your questions in the sidebar. We would love to be able to post them here. And um, so today we're talking about emotional spending. And, and let's just kick it off, Ginger, with the first question, which is, well, what is emotional spending? Um, emotional spending is essentially when you're spending beyond your means and you're making purchases while you're under a lot of stress. So, for instance, if you've had a bad day at work, your coworker may have pissed you off, something like that. Maybe you had a you know had a fight with your husband. You're like, I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to go get some retail therapy. Um, and that's pretty much what emotional spending is, which can sometimes run into a spending addiction. I like you to use that term, Ginger, retail therapy. Mm -hmm. I, I had never heard that term before until I was reading on a. Uh, Christina did a Periscope this week about emotional spending, and someone mentioned that in the comments. And uh, one of the ladies who was who was watching said that she likes to spend money whenever she's mad at her husband. That's <laughs> <laughs> one of the triggers. Yeah, I mean, your husband can be like a game warden when you're trying to go hunting. <laughs> 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 so I can totally understand where she's coming from, but I mean, if it's like a re you know, if it's a repeated habit where you're constantly shopping every time you're pissed off, then yeah, it's a problem now because you're certainly not spending the money that you've intended to spend. You're spending it because you're upset. Paul, how, how would you define emotional spending? Well, when I'm meeting with people, we always define emotional spending as any spending that's done without a plan. Um, so if, if you haven't planned for it in advance and it's not necessary, so you know, you know, things happen that, that we don't always plan for, but if it's not a necessary expense and it's not planned money, then that's going to be an emotional spend because we, we really didn't put that in the budget. We didn't put it in any sort of uh, plan of action that we, we started at the beginning of the month. Is it, um, I mean, what, what are some of the triggers that you guys see for emotional spending? Ginger, how, how do people identify like, what those things are? that cause you to spend? I would say, I mean, if you're, again, if you're just upset with something, it could be anything that's going on in your life that's causing you to be under a high level of stress. I mean, clinically, sometimes, yeah, people who get really happy, sometimes they go out and they blow their rent money or their mortgage money. But usually it's someone who's really upset. So it could be for any number of reasons. It could be, again, like you've had an argument with someone, a hard day at work. Maybe you're having financial issues, but still you're deciding to go out there and spend every dime you have on the latest pair of Jimmy Choo's or, you know, Christian, you know, the red, bo the red bottom shoes. So it's for me, it's really just you're upset. You're going to go out and spend and it's not money that you plan to spend. Ginger, I see a comment here by, by Nora in the sidebar here. She says, I think emotional eating is worse. Is there a link between emotional spending and emotional eating? 
I would say not necessarily a link, but it's the same. It's the same addiction. It's what we call a process addiction. So I mean, it's the same function where there's a trigger, and then you're obsessing about either eating or spending, and then you're actually going to go ahead and eat or spend too much, and then you're going to go through the guilt. After the guilt sets in, then you're going to feel like, okay, so I need to go and relieve this anxiety that I have because of the guilt, and you go and eat and spend again. Mm -hmm. So it's the same type of addiction. I see. Usually they're the same for me. <laughs> My emotional yeah. spend is let's go have dinner out somewhere. <laughs> uh, Nora commented definitely when a person is not thinking clearly, they do stuff or even buy things that they don't need. Well, yeah, think of it with, with emotional spenders, you're going to find that these are people that uh, they get a high off of spending. So typically, this means their brain's releasing dopamine or something like that. There are really two kinds of people. There are people that actually spending money is painful to them, and there are people that it's enjoyable. And we always call those like the free spirits or, you know, depending on what it is. These are people that actually enjoy that spending process. And so no matter what that is, you know, like we talked about eating, that it, some people eating is just that pleasurable. It releases those same kind of chemicals. But it's almost like a self-medication kind of thing. Um, some people, you know, go drink a beer later in the evening, and that kind of releases that same kind of thing. And that's just basically what we're looking at is, is people that are looking for that dopamine fix almost is mm. that uh, that really makes a big difference in, in what's happening and, and why they're spending that extra money, even though they either they don't have it or it wasn't planned. Ginger, uh, how do you find how do people identify what those triggers are? Um, pretty much if you notice that you're so think about what what's happening right before you go out and spend the money again. So what's happening? Are you. Again, are you upset with someone? Are you feeling a lot of anxiety and stress? There are some people who are just experiencing high anxiety for whatever reason. It could be their in-laws are coming to town. It could be mm. that you know their kid had a bad day at school and so they're really anxious and they need to go out and just sort of blow off some steam. And so um, like Rod said, he's like, well, I'm gonna go out and have dinner. Like I totally understand that because hey, you might wanna go out for happy hour just to have a drink or two just to sort of feel better about your day. So if you recognize a pattern of going out to spend money while you're upset and while you're just under a high amount of stress, then I would say you know that you're having a problem, especially if it's you're spending money that you know you're not supposed to be spending. Like, again, your mortgage money, your rent money. Um, you can't make your car payment this month because, hey, I just spent it all on, you know, clothes. Nora just asked uh, Ginger, what is a way or what are some ways to help reduce this stress or anxiety to help avoid this overbuying or overeating? I would say by identifying the source. So if you see that you're getting involved in a certain situation that, again, is your trigger, then you'll have to make sure that you're being mindful of being exposed to that trigger. So, for instance, if I know that I'm going to have a really, you know, tough client come in, uh, where I have to like spend all my brain energy and resources um, in the session, then I'll make sure that I take a walk yeah. in between sessions just to blow off some steam because I don't want to carry that energy into the next session because when I get off work, I'm going to be tempted to just, hey, let's go to happy hour. Let's go and go out to eat or let's go shopping because I want to feel better. So being able to identify your triggers is really, really important. And then also being committed to having a lot of restraint because I can know that that's a trigger, but if I'm not committed to restraining mm -hmm. myself, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I think I think that's the sometimes the hard part is identifying what those triggers are because it can be different for so many people. Like you were just mentioning, Ginger, like depending on your profession, depending on what's going on in your family, uh, it could be the holiday season that just causes more stress and maybe causes mm -hmm. you more to, to overeat or to be buying more things just because of the stress going on. So I, I like your approach, Ginger, of like identifying like what what is the origin, what's what's causing mm -hmm. it, and then. Uh, once you've kind of figured out what that is, then then building in that restraint. But Ginger, like, once you've identified it, let's say that you've identified that, well, um, whenever I get together with family, that causes me to have a lot of anxiety, which makes mm -hmm. me want to go buy things. How do you then move from finding the origin, the trigger, and then move to like having the restraint? Uh, thinking about the alternative. So if I know that I was late on my mortgage payment, and I got hit with a late payment. If I know that I was really stressed out because I wasn't able to make, you know, whatever financial obligation that I was supposed to make, then I'm going to be thinking about that consequence. It's all about consequential thinking. If I don't do X, then this is going to happen. And this is too painful to continue on in the same 
way that I'm going. And it usually takes emotional spenders a little while to sort of recognize that they have a problem. They'll just say, oh, well, you know, I think I just saw someone say that in the comments. I just love shopping. Yeah. But if you're doing it to the extent <laughs> of having really negative consequences, then you have to consider that there may be a problem. Paul, I wanted to ask you just about some of these um, identifying triggers when when you when you counsel people or just look at your own spending, have you found any triggers for yourself or with others that kind of cause more overspending? Um, it's really just about each individual is going to have a different set of triggers. So it's going to be personal experience that plays into it. Um, people that are lonely um, frequently will spend to, to just to get that, you know, feeling of loneliness, you're out with the people and you also feel good about whatever you bought. Um, if you're struggling with self-worth, uh, people that are feeling powerless, maybe you're in a bad situation at work and you don't have the power to make those changes. These all can contribute to those kind of things. And it's really just about digging down into your personal experiences and figuring out, hey, where is this trigger coming from? What in my past experience you know, has caused me to kind of turn to this for this you know, self you know, medication, self therapy through, through spending. Rod, you know, you speak at conferences all the time and, and counsel people on credit and money issues. Um, does overspending come up quite a bit with you? All the time. And I think we see it in just in our business. You know, when you look at credit reporting, that's sort of where, uh, you know, people talk about their credit scores and their credit reports. And that's where it sort of surfaces because they'll use that credit card as an easy way to spend and not have to see the consequences immediately. And it's that immediacy that tends to be the problem that comes back later. It's easy to go feel empowered, buy something just like Paul and Ginger said. And then a month later you get the bill and that's when mm. that sort of euphoric feeling of buying something comes crashing in. And then you're dealing with that emotion of, you know, how do I recover from this and what do I do now? Uh, but it, yeah, it happens all the time and it's tied into the same questions we get, you know, around how do I manage my credit? How do I uh, improve my, my financial well being? And I think for a lot of us, emotional spending is what gets us in trouble in the first place. It's sort of like that impulse buy. You know, it's, it's something you want, makes you feel good. And later you find out it doesn't make you feel as good as you thought you were um, going to. Yeah. I want to thank everyone who's joining us here on Blab. We are here with Ginger and Paul Moyer and Rod Griffin. And we're talking about emotional spending. Thank you so much for joining us here. If you guys have any questions about emotional spending, we'd love to read your comments in the sidebar. Um, go, you can go ahead and post them right there. And if you'd like to give any props to our guests, all you need to do is click on the screen and you can give them some love. So as they're talking, please give our guests some, some props. Um, a lot of great discussions happening here. Um, Jodster112 just says, Ginger, I just spent $200 on shoes and uh, commented Dr. Martin's LOL. Um, <laughs> you know, some, sometimes like, yeah, for some, for some, it, it could be shoes, like something that you're really, really interested in and, and, uh, just passing by a shoe store could be a trigger. Like I need to buy shoes. Mm -hmm. um, what What are ways to kind of deal with some of these specific triggers that you uh, maybe sometimes feel like you can't help yourself? Um, that's so. So for me, my oh, Amazon.com. So if you have Amazon Prime, then you know what I'm yeah. talking about. Right? <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Amazon Prime. Yes. Yeah. So I'm in the I'm in the DC metro area, not far from Baltimore. So it's not hard to get something the same day. So it could be lunchtime and I'm browsing Amazon. I'm like, wait, I want that. I don't need it. I want it. And it'll be at my doorstep by 8 p.m. Right. And so yeah. I limit my time on Amazon because if there's just that instant immediate gratification of, OK, well, this is a good price. You know, I've always wanted this. It'll be here tonight when I get home. And it's like, yeah, no. So what I do now is I keep it in my shopping cart. My shopping cart is pretty large right now because I haven't been um, buying anything from it. But I keep stuff in there. And if I don't really, really need it, then it's going to sit there for at least two weeks before I consider buying it. And if after two weeks, I'm like, eh, eh, I didn't really need it in the first place. So, I mean, just because I write about money doesn't mean that I don't go through the same like, oh, I want this impulse spending. Um, but I have to ha exercise some level of restraint myself, too. Mm -hmm. So that's, oh, that's how I do it because Amazon is a devil for my wallet. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amazon Prime can make it really easy because, like, oh man, there it is on the screen. I can have it tomorrow, possibly. Yes. Yeah, that could, that could really, yeah.
I could definitely, yeah, I can definitely see that as being a big trigger. <laughs> to buy things, no doubt, no doubt. When they send you text messages like, um, "You have things in your shopping cart. Did you want to buy those?" We lost Mike. Can you we lost Mike. Mike. Can you hear me? Okay. I hear oh, you. I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, no. Okay. Okay. Well, at least you can hear me. That's the most important thing. <laughs> um. And now we can't. And now we can't. <laughs> Is he well, I'll just add to what Ginger was saying. Was um, in my family, we're big believers in cash envelopes um, for any type of emotional spending, whether that's food dining out, anything like that, the cash envelope is, is our number one way for restricting that. And so like um, the example I use with people, because emotional spending business isn't always about how you feel, but when you have kids, it's also about, you know, getting them to leave you alone. <laughs> and so what I tell people is, you know, our, our base example, we call it the Barbie movie example. And that's, you know, you, you're in the grocery store, you got your kid with you and, and your daughter's sitting there and she loves Barbie and she sees the Barbie movie and she's like, I, I want the Barbie movie, I want the Barbie movie, I want the Barbie movie over and over again. And so you give in and you buy that $20 Barbie movie, which is ridiculous. But see, if you, have, if you have cash envelopes, you're going to do that one time because what will happen is you're going to get to the end of the month and the envelope it will be empty and you're hungry and you're actually thinking about eating the Barbie movie because <laughs> A, you will never have to watch it because you've watched it like 70 times now. You'll never have to watch it again and it might provide a little nutritional value. So that is the example that we always use is this, you know, having those cash envelopes because having to spend cash, that's a painful transaction for almost mm -hmm. every American. Mm -hmm. And what, we know, what, I would, what I know from statistics is McDonald's was the last fast food restaurant to switch to credit cards. They switched to credit cards and they saw a 17% increase in sales the next month Wow! because they started accepting credit cards. And so having that cash in hand and actually doing that with a cash transaction is going to make a huge difference in your spending just because you're not going to, you're going to look in that envelope and go, okay, it's, it's the second and I've spent half my money. Mm -hmm. um, that's not good. I better slow this thing down because there's actually a visual representation of that money going out of your hand and in, into the uh, cash register. Paul, I love the example, how can parents like help their kids? Because I'm thinking about your example you just shared about you know, your kids want something and you go ahead and buy it. Um, and you're talking about ways to deal with that. But how can parents like help mold their kids uh, through this process? Because kids have um, impulses like you've just identified. Um, how can parents like help their kids deal with impulses early on? So as they when they get older, they they can be more, uh, I guess, just more uh, have more self self-restraint. Right. Uh, what we do is my first question, whenever my kids ask for anything in the store that wasn't part of the plan for when we were going in there is, do you have money? Um, so my son constantly, my, my son is a natural saver. He's six and he's got almost a hundred dollars in his piggy bank. Mm -hmm. So, and he's saving for a car to give you kind of a perspective. So <laughs> wow. I've been working that into him. Well, I wanted to, nice. I told him, I was like, there's going to come a day when you're going to want to go out without me and you'll be able to drive and you'll want to have a car. So you better start saving for that now. But <laughs> he, he wants to spend my money all the time. So I constantly asking, I was like, do you want to spend your money on this? And he actually will think about that. And mm -hmm. kids will think about it. If you give them an opportunity to think through those things, but the big, the next thing, the next step we're taking is we're just about to move into allowances and we're going to move to, we do four jars in my family. Some people do three, mm -hmm. One is spending, one is saving, one is giving. Um, we do gifts, which we like buying things for other people. And and then the final one we do is uh, we're Christians, so we do a tithe, and he has to put 10% of any money that he gets into his tithe tithe jar. And so that's kind of our next step. So we're, we're teaching that you know credibility that says, hey, it's okay to spend as long as you plan for it, as long as you're doing the right things and not overspending. And that way, you know, they don't ever have this idea, hey, I can just put it on a credit card. It's all going to be in a cash transaction and try to build it into them over the 12 years before they go to college and somebody's offered them a t-shirt and a two liter to get a credit card. Mm -hmm. So that's how a lot of us got tricked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I still got my mic. That's I told you I, I salvaged it before my wife threw it away. I have my uh, uh, twenty year old T shirt from when I went to college and got my first credit card. Yeah, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a picture and send it to you. you. It is awesome. Oh, you, you totally should. I love it's, that. It, it says Daytona Beach in some year in the '90s on it, but it's awesome. <laughs> That's great. I want to see that. Uh, so, so, Paul, I love the example you you've shared about you know parents with kids. Ginger, can you talk a little bit about couples? And how um, 
maybe there's one partner in the relationship who is has more has more triggers to spend. Mm -hmm. How can couples work together on this when um, when triggers are kind of known? I would say being able to sit down and have the conversation is like you need that first to be able to acknowledge the issues and the potential issues that could happen. So, for instance, if you know that one partner is spending recklessly, really beginning to I mean, being able to give them a lot of grace is key yeah. because it's so we're so tempted to judge our partners and just think, well, you should know better and you should be doing this and you should be doing that. But really, this is an emotional issue for a lot of people. And so being able to work with them and create a plan that works for them. So if you know that, you know, maybe if I give $50 a week or $50 a month, whatever can work for your budget, hey, you can spend this if you're upset, as opposed to you can't spend anything. Cold turkey rarely works. So being able to work with them and to sort of walk it back a little bit to an amount that actually works for your budget and your relationship is really good. It's a, you know, I think that's a really good move to do if you're in a relationship. Yeah, uh, Rod, I see this comment here from Avon who says, budget is a swear word to some people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a, um, Barbara, uh, who is on, from Rutgers, who's on with us once in a while. I tease her because she doesn't use the word budget either. Mm -hmm. but, and I tell her, she, she prefers spending plan. And I tell her I'm from Texas and we call it a budget because that's what it is. But <laughs> if you need to soften it and call it something else, feel free. Um <laughs> You know, like sort of like the emotional spending uh, term yeah, <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Like you're still spending, but um, yeah, it's funny. And you know, talking about the same thing in our household, we use the uh, ours, mine, and hers sort of plan. So my budget's driven by my allowance. You know, we we agree on how much we have to spend, and then I know exactly what I have, mm -hmm. and I plan from there just for spending, whether it's gifts or giving or sort of the same thing. And we break it down, but we have our budget that goes for all of the essentials and we'll always talk about how we're going to spend that money mm -hmm. and operate from if not a formal budget an informal one and then that way if i buy something and my wife doesn't like it i can tell her that's mine out of my money <laughs> <laughs> so, you don't need and yes i know so that's <laughs> off limits but and, and those shoes you bought i won't say anything about it. So, <laughs> it's like, is that yours but you know so it's but um so it, it it works for us you know but we but it's the same issue if we're going to spend on something as a, as a household as it, we are going to talk about it first mm -hmm. and it we, and again we try to make it goal driven it's never a why do you buy that mm -hmm. it's okay we want to do something in the future how do we save for that? And, and what are we going to do to get there? Mm -hmm. um, so that it always starts from a, a positive mm -hmm. stance rather than a, a conflict. Um, and I think that's been really helpful for us that we don't let money be a source of argument. It's a source of a way to work together mm -hmm. and, and plan together for what Absolutely. we want to accomplish. You know, and yeah. that's hugely important. My, my wife and I went through Dave Ramsey our first month of marriage. Oh, um, wow. So it was a conscious decision. So we yeah. started out with a little bit of debt and we paid all that off. We were actually debt free by uh, 14 months into our marriage. We've awesome. been married 11 years. Congratulations. So it made a, this made a big difference. But the biggest thing is we have a monthly budget meeting. Um, it, those are pretty quick now because we're on the, we've been on the yeah. same page for a long time. But if you can just sit down with your spouse and have that monthly meeting that says, okay, what's this going to look like mm -hmm. this coming month? So, you know, at the end of November, we're working on December. My wife puts the whole budget together. I look through it, give any, I, you know, we basically just go back and forth. And that's where we set our spending money for the month, or we call it blow money. That's not drugs. That's not drugs. I can go blow it. I can go blow it. I want to. It's not drugs. Yeah, it's the set aside for the emotional spending. I think, and I think that's important. So if you can, you set aside those funds so that you you are essentially budgeting for that emotional spending. And so guys, you, you, get, you get like extra points if you spend your spending money on her. Oh, yes, yeah. good point. <laughs> Little definitely, shiny sparkly definitely. things are even definitely. better. Yeah. No, uh, Paul, I want to hear more about your your monthly budget session with your wife. This is awesome. Okay, so we use it. We have our own spreadsheet that's been developed over time. It's really nerdy and crazy, but it, it works <laughs> awesome. And you'll you'll do the same thing over time as you adjust your budget for yourself. But basically, it's just my my wife is the is the planned person in our family. The month to month, she gets everything done on time. I'm not that person. I'm 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 absolutely certain that she has paid for her engagement ring and late fees. <laughs> absolutely. So she sits down and she makes 
makes that initial plan, which most of it's already planned out. Water bill, light bill, home, you know, uh, mortgage, all that stuff is kind of going to be fairly static. It, that just goes, gets plugged in. It's just that bit of discretionary spending and whatever we're going to save or where we're going to send. If, you know, if we have a good month and we have some extra money, where are we going to put that extra money? And that's where that discussion comes in. And the biggest thing is that way we're working together. We're, no, no one person is completely in charge of the budget. We're both you know, responsible to each other. And that's where we also set our boundaries. So like if there's something that's going on and we're like, you know, we need to do this, but maybe not right now, we set up our boundaries of how, what, it, what constitutes an emotional spend inside of our budget. So, mm -hmm. you know, like we have a little, we have money set aside just for our house. Well, what constitutes an emotional spend on our house? Is that going to be $20? Is that going to be $50? Mm -hmm. And if, if, so for us on, on the house, it's, it's 50 bucks, it's less than 50 bucks. Then we can, you know, you can do it without talking to the other spouse, but if it's more than $50, you better call. And that, and that way we can have that discussion somewhere during the month. And that way, no, one, neither one of us is coming out the other one going, well, it was in, it was in the account, but it was still technically an emotional spend because just because we wanted that. How, yeah, how did that, you guys ever deal with, like, if you ever, have you ever gotten off track? Like, have we ever gotten off track? Money, like really off track. Yeah, that's a good question. Not since we've been married, we've not been super off track because okay. we, because we put all those safeguards in place mm -hmm. and, and because we, I mean, when we started, it was 20 bucks. I mean, when we were first married, the dollar went out was $20. If it was more than $20, you called the other spouse. Mm. So it was pretty sweet. We set the, the limits pretty low when we started off. And, you know, we didn't have as much money. My wife was still in college when we got married. So that that was a big difference. And that's how we made those kind of transactions easier. Because once you get into the habit, you're like, oh, you know, it's 50 bucks. I better call, better call Amy just to make sure that this is okay. It's in the budget. And that makes – because normally one of us is in front of a computer or, we, or you can pull it up on your smartphone now if you put it in a Google Doc. You can pull the whole budget up right there on your smartphone or Mint or one of the other ones that's out there. Mm -hmm. They're all sitting there waiting with your budget. And you can say, okay, well, I've got $500 in home savings, but you know this is going to be 65 Let me just make sure this is not going to derail something we're going to do in the future because you know maybe my wife was saving that to buy a new tile mm -hmm. for some other random project that she does. Like she's building a table – today so yeah, <laughs> so yeah. whatever it is you know she may have she may have that money earmarked for something saying i wanted to build this piece of furniture which my wife is awesome at building things just so you know she's built like four things in our house like she built a chair from pieces of wood it wow, was amazing that's, that's awesome. so anyway but that makes but she may have those things earmarked for something we just want to make sure that that is an earmark for something and, and that you're basically putting yourself off course as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, Ginger, I, mean, I was listening to Paul. Like, there's definitely some couples that are almost like hardwired that they can work very, very well together on budgets. And and Paul and his wife are actually just a prime example of this. Um, they've sat down monthly, been going through this for a very long time and are doing really well. But not every couple can do that. What, what advice would you have for the couple um, that is having a, a real struggle with budgeting? I see a, a comment here from Chicago Sally who says, it's so hard to plan and stick to a budget. I feel like extra stuff is always coming up. What advice would you give to the couple who is having a very difficult time having those conversations? Yeah, I mean, I find a lot of couples who got married maybe later on in life, like let's just say they get married early 30s, mid 30s, late 30s, 40s, 50s, they're already really set in their ways financially. So they've not had, they've perhaps not had someone for a period of time checking them on their, on their spending. And so that can be really difficult to have someone say, you can only spend this much um, or else. I think it's all about your approach, right? And I think that when you're approaching them from the perspective that this is a collaboration as opposed to a dictatorship, um, I think that's helpful. And then also dropping the rope, like the tug of war that tends to happen with a lot of couples when it comes to money. You know, I'm the one that makes the money, so therefore I get to tell you what to do and how to spend it. I think it's really important to be mindful of how you're approaching it. And again, from a collaborative standpoint and coming at it from like, I know that when you get upset that you like to go and shop and do this, um, maybe again, giving them a certain amount that they can spend if they're in the position where, okay, so I need to go out and blow off some steam. So maybe you have $50 here, a hundred bucks here where you can spend it without any sort of consequences. Um, but if you know that you have someone or you're married to someone who is very reckless, I mean, I've even recommended where the couples come together and that particular, that, you know, that partner doesn't have access to the bank account to be like a debit mm. card or a credit card. And they've had, they have to agree if they want their bills to be paid. So it seems some really extreme situations and I've seen situations where, okay, so them being able to sit down and have the conversation was the key and really extreme situations where we've had to take away the debit card. 
Ginger, what advice do you have for the partner who is taking on the more submissive role and the person who's being very domineering is wanting to control every aspect of the budget and it's actually not healthy for their relationship. It's mm -hmm. hurting their relationship more than anything. What advice do you give for that, for that partner who's having difficulty? Yeah, I see a lot of women like that, um, believe it or not. I mean, I have women who their paychecks are deposited into accounts and they don't have access to those accounts, um, but they're making the money. So, I mean, there are a lot of, there are some more deeper emotional issues going on. I would definitely tell them to seek the advice um, and the counsel of a therapist so that they'd be able to work through some of those issues because they're not going to be able to do it within their relationship. They have to understand the dynamics of the relationship, why they chose that person, um, what's actually going on and what allows that person to control them and what allows you to allow that person to control you in the way that they do. Because without that, you're going to keep on having the same loop over and over again. You submit, and they are just like more control. And you submit, they control. You have to break the cycle. And often, it really does take um, seeking a therapist to be able to help show you the dynamics there. That's probably going to require couples therapy too, because there's there's a reason why that person wants that much control as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason why those two people were attracted to each other, where you have the submissive and the controlling person, um, and that that's going to make a huge difference in their relationship. I, and I I constantly I get people that meet with me, and I'm like I, I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm a money person, um, <laughs> so I'm always trying to steer them back away from those complaints. But the, the biggest thing mm -hmm. is you know the money's you know money is super personal if it's your money, and so you've got to understand. Um, the biggest thing we push in, in our meetings is changing your your pronouns and from mine and hers or mine and his, his and hers to ours and we. And then uh, when you can start using those pronouns without thinking, then you've kind of moved past this, you know, controlling versus submissive role and you start moving towards, hey, we're, we're rowing in the same direction together. We're trying to have the same goals and have the same accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I love that. Paul, um, I mean, it's awesome to hear about the story. I mean, you're just very successful story, but you and your wife, have you partnered together on this? Have you guys run across any obstacles uh, during this time? Uh, the, well, the, the one thing we fight over is who has the cash envelopes. But other than that, <laughs> um, I mean, other than, you know, our setbacks of, you know, we've been able to make decisions because of our, our choice to be free of debt other than our house. Yeah. We've been able to make financial decisions that allowed us to take different risks than other people and other friends of ours allowed my wife to stay home for six months after the birth of our third child um, instead of having to go right back to work. All our kids were born in the summer. My wife's a teacher, so we magically had oh, this plan. To that's have awesome, Paul. But awesome. she likes <laughs> you, she, you guys she are likes, so uh, good. <laughs> it's 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 not always this well planned as it sounds, but it, you know, it just happened that way. So, <laughs> But uh, and you're in the north, right? No, I'm in South Carolina. <laughs> oh, okay, so it's not a snowstorm related. Nobody issue, wants right? to have okay. children in the summer in South Carolina. Yeah, because no. being nine months pregnant in July in South Carolina, not mm. fun. No. No. It's For not anybody. No, I'm just like no. on the third one. I was just I was scooping up the two other kids. I'm like, let's just go. Just be quiet. Don't don't wake her up. Let's go. Come on. We'll we'll go out the door. Mommy won't ever see us. It'll be okay. Don't wake her. She'll scare you. So, but you know, but those kind of things. Um, it's allowed us to do those kind of things where my wife got to stay home for six months versus having to go. She's a, she's a part-time teacher. So versus going right back to, into school and us, you know, was it, you know, the most fun money time of our lives? No, but we got to make that decision. She got to stay home a little longer because, um, you know, we, we didn't have to have that money in the bank. And that's, that's made a huge difference in our lives from that perspective is we've consistently gotten to make decisions that weren't necessarily money motivated. They were family oriented or they were relationship oriented. So we could have, those discussions and, and not have to worry about the money. Cause when you, when you don't have the money saved up, when you're not having that cooperation, every time you have a problem, you have, you have a problem and then a money problem. You, you double all your problems. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing that we tell people is, you know, when my, if you, if you don't have money ready for your car repairs, you've got a car problem and a money problem. Whereas in my family, we've just got a car problem. In fact, six months ago, both my cars broke down on the same day. I had to ride to the shop Man. with my minivan and my SUV on one tow truck. <laughs> and oh, just, <laughs> yeah. And mm. so where my mother-in-law came and got my wife and kids and took them away while I took care of all the, but I didn't have a money problem. I just had car problems. And I just mm. talked to my mechanic and said, Hey, I got to have one of these back today. And he got me one back that day and we just paid for it. It makes a huge difference in your life because you're, you're just not stressed over money that much. And then not having that stress doesn't lead to more emotional spending. Mm -hmm. Paul, can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about, Oh, Rod, go ahead. 
Well, I was going to say that's when my wife and I were first starting out, the biggest conflict we had was the emergency fund conversation. And that caused some tension. But I, I finally won. I'll claim that one argument that I won. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know, and insisted that we have at least $1,000 in, in an emergency. And at the time, you know, we lived in a, like a 700 square foot, one bedroom apartment, you know, and weren't making much. And so it was, it was tough. It took us quite a while to say, but, and, but once it's there, it relieves some of that stress. So it's like, it's one of those little things, one thing at a time to get to, you know, that the position where you're in a better money place. And, and once we had that, you know, I was more comfortable, she was more comfortable and it paid off because not long after, you know, we had a car problem. I had three flat tires on the same vehicle on the same day. So it was, you know, because yeah. they were bad tires and so same thing, went to the bank, paid it off. And then we were back to saving again and getting that emergency fund back so that we didn't have to worry about that issue. So that emotional spend and that emergency spend, that one of the wisest things I ever heard was a gentleman who said that there aren't any, um, unexpected expenses they're just unplanned for expenses mm -hmm. and you know having that getting through that and getting on the same page once you're there makes it so much easier ginger can you talk, can you talk a little bit about how uh, emotional spending uh can be avoided through budgeting so hopefully you don't hate me for this but i don't i really don't advocate budgeting for emotional okay. spending um, because it's an emotional issue. And the reality mm. is if budgets helped, um, but they, they don't, right? Because it's mm. too restrictive. And the person that we're dealing with has a problem with restriction. And so the way that we do it is we get back to basics, which is to understand what what's going on here and why are you being triggered? How are you being triggered? Um, so that we can get to the root of the problem. Then we can talk about a spending plan. I don't, I don't like the word budget, mm. but we can go with a spending okay. plan. Yeah. Um, so that we can then determine, well, what, what are your limits? And depending on how serious the issue is, do we take away the debit card? Do we take away access for a while? Or do we then decide, well, how can we have weekly meetings about your money? Because accountability has to be top of mind for this person. It can't be, well, we'll have a meeting quarterly um, or twice a year. It has to be on a weekly basis where they're being accountable for their spending habits. And Ginger, for these weekly meetings, is this with their partner? Is this with a financial counselor? Who's this with? It can be either or, but I mean, just depending on what the tension level in the relationship, sometimes they may need some a third party to come in there and play a referee. I know that a lot of money coaches have talked to me where they feel really overwhelmed with certain clients and they refer to me because they're like, well, I can't deal with the emotional issues in this relationship. There's a lot more going on and the money issues are just a symptom of larger issues going on. So if it's a high tension relationship where it's really volatile, a third party might be needed. But if it's a situation where they just need to learn how to communicate with each other, then the two of them are just fine um, doing that on their own. Now, uh, Paul, you had mentioned um, earlier on about the envelope system, which has helped you and your wife with uh, emotional spending because you are you only have a certain amount of money in that envelope. Can you talk a little bit about that system for those that have never heard of it before? Absolutely. You basically take any area in your budget where you, you have a tendency to overspend. Um, for most people, I mean, even if you're not necessarily an emotional spender, most people are going to be food, so be groceries and dining out. Entertainment is a big one. Personal care, uh, people that, that like to spend money, you know, getting dolled up, whatever that is, whether that's manicures, pedicures, or anything else, that those are things that we can overspend on really easily because, you know, if the person says, hey, we've got a sale on such and such product, you can just say, oh, you know, it was doll, you know, throw that right on the top of whatever it was. It was only six dollars more. So those cash inflows make a huge difference in saying, OK, <clears throat> for our entertainment budget, you know, this month, it's a rough month. We're only going to spend 50 bucks on entertainment. That means, you know, Redbox is going to become our friend. And uh, you know, that's <laughs> going to make a huge difference in you know how we do those kind of things and make sure that, that we don't uh, overspend. Um, going back to something Ginger said real quick, talking about doing weekly. Um, I did a lot of work with the guys that I was broke now. I'm not.com. They actually have a weekly budget form 
on their website mm -hmm. where you can uh, actually download it and it breaks the month up by weeks. So if mm -hmm. you're if you're in this place where you need to actually budget each individual paycheck instead of doing a whole month, they actually have a form that helps you do that. Mm -hmm. And that breaks it down a lot easier than uh, than what I've seen most places. It's all going to be mostly a monthly budget where, where this does the monthly budget, but breaks it down by a week. And so you can have those weekly conversations that, that Ginger was talking about as opposed to just having that one monthly conversation. And to pick uh, up, Paul, 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 go ahead, Ginger, go ahead. Pocket Smith um, also offers the same thing it's online so it's pocketsmith.com and you can actually budget out each paycheck or each month or you can do it in six months spurts you can actually see how each um you know expense affects your money two weeks one month six months down the line because they actually have a cash flow calendar that i'm, I'm a huge fan of it because if you need if you're in a position where you need to budget each paycheck that's a really good system um, to mm -hmm. get on with to get on board with I just awesome. put a link to those budgeting tools I mentioned in, in the sidebar over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Paul. Ginger, can you put a link out to that yeah. website too as well? Absolutely. That'd, That'd be, be wonderful. Uh, Paul, someone just asked a question. Uh, Shannon just asked, um, so you don't believe in using credit cards even though they give cash back? Uh, I don't believe in credit cards for people that can't handle them. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you, how you are. I had credit card debt entering my marriage. That was part of our debt payoff. Um, so we didn't have credit cards five years, four years, okay. somewhere in that range. Um, once we had everything under control, we now put all, in my family, we put all recurring expenses on the credit card. So that's uh, electric bill, cable bill, any of those things that are going to go, we put all those on the credit card just to build points. Yeah. As gasoline, um, I've never met anybody that overspends on gasoline. I don't know about you guys, but you know, <laughs> I don't go, you know, I don't go to the trunk and go, I just need a little bit more and start putting it in the trunk, you know, but so those are the kind of things that I don't recommend cash envelopes for gasoline for that reason. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, that makes a big difference. But yeah, if, if you have not proven worthy of using your credit cards, then I would recommend you cut them up so that you don't use them. Um, I know some people will actually freeze them a block of ice just in case they need it. So something crazy happens happens the the you know you know the process of getting it out of that block of ice is a possibility but yeah credit <laughs> cards are a no no for most for, for anybody that hasn't proven they can handle them and that's that's a process that's going to take time of you sticking to a plan over months and months and months to uh to to keep away from those um because because the money you pay in interest is nothing is is so much more than the, the amount you get back in rewards and that's really what the difference is because you know 22 percent adds up a, a lot faster than one percent and that's the biggest difference you're going to see. That's right. Rod, can you talk a little bit about uh, credit? Because, you know, for those that can't, you know, for those that are abusing it, it can be detrimental. Can you talk about how credit uh, can be also be a tool and just also your views on credit? Yeah, it's, I agree with Paul. If you can't manage a credit card and it gets you in trouble, you shouldn't use them. Uh, you, know, you have to be prepared. I actually, we write the Ask Experian column. And one of the early questions we got years ago was, a person wrote in and said she has a credit card and, and she, I know it was a she because she said she was a she, uh, but I've <laughs> talked to he's that had the same problem. Um, but she, she said, you know, I have a credit card and it keeps buying stuff and, and I can't make it. Wait, what do wait, I do? And it keeps, buying, stuff? It keeps buying things. And I, and I wrote back, my first response was, I really want to see your credit card because I've never seen one get off, off the table, go to the store, buy something and bring it back without you making that decision. But, you know, but it was a very emotional issue. And, and, you know, so credit cards take responsibility. If you use them well, they can be a financial tool. You know, and I've talked about it before too, that, you know, if you're using a credit card, especially this time of year, uh, you might want to, if a store's offering a discount, if you use their a credit account, if you can get 15% off and you apply for that card and get instant credit and then turn around and pay it off in full the next day, and maybe even turn around and close the account, but take advantage of that opportunity. Not necessarily a bad thing to do. Uh, and if you're buying things and getting points, so you get discounts. But if you're using credit cards, it's not just a substitute for cash. There needs to be additional benefit. Right. Uh, and you need to think about why you're using that card. And if you're making those charges, it, you should ideally pay them in full every month. If you're not going to pay them in full, you need to understand exactly why, when you're going to pay it back, how you're going to pay it back, and what other purchases you're going to do without if you're going to make that purchase. I mean, there's a, you should be very thoughtful about using cards. The other thing 
you know, that people ask me often is how many cards should I have? You know, do I need 10 or 15? The answer is no, you don't. You need one or two <laughs> is plenty for most of us. So, um, you know, some people do and, and do well. You know, I have a, I know a, a person that collects affinity cards. And so with the picture for the pictures, don't know what he does with them, but he had it one point more than 100 credit cards. I could wow. I would never get credit again if a lender looked at my credit report and said, why do you have 100 credit cards? It'd be, you know, <laughs> we don't need to give you another one. Um, you know, so it's, you know, with in terms of credit, emotional spending is what tends to get people in trouble that, you know, they buy on impulse. They buy in response to stress. Uh, they buy to celebrate without thinking about having that budget or, or that spending plan. Sorry, Ginger. Um, but you know, it's, but you have to be aware of how you're using credit as a financial tool. If you're not capable of managing it because of emotional reasons or other reasons, you, you are probably better not using credit. You know, it's not for everybody, although we don't think about that. You know, it's important. Uh, you know, if you're going to, as Paul said, you know, his, his Debt is buying a house. Most of us have that same issue. We can't pay cash for a house. So you need to have a credit card. Um, from what I understand, you can buy Dave Ramsey's program with a credit card on his website. Um, <laughs> you know, so nothing wrong with that, yeah, you know, and, yeah. but again, you know, it's a security issue, in fact, to do that. So, you know, credit isn't just about debt and try to separate the two, but you have to plan to use credit and, We've worked with the, Consum the Consumer Federation of America, America Saves, several years ago. They did a, a survey, and what they found was people who have the best credit also have the best savings habits. So they plan for spending, they save well, and they use credit wisely. It's sort of a mindset that goes together. If, if you're looking for awards, some of the stores are actually getting smart and offering debit cards now, like Target has their red yeah. card, debit card. Um, you can, a lot of times you can get those same rewards through those debit cards. Um, so obviously the advantage is there's no credit involved. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, a big, it's, it's a big help to people because the stores are now realizing that the consumer information is more valuable than the interest that people are paying. And so, because yeah. being Target can, Target target markets their people better than almost anybody. I mean, they, they know when people are pregnant before their spouses do. So that's that's how awesome Target is at marketing that's to people because they know what people buy when they're pregnant. And there's a story out there of a dad who didn't know his teenage daughter was pregnant, but they, she started getting stuff in the mail and uh, from Target because she started buying the things that pregnant women buy. And he like called them up and was like ripping them a new one. And he had to like write an apology note because right. they were actually right. And she just hadn't told him yet. So that's the kind of stuff. That, but that, that information is so valuable. They are switching to debit cards slowly um, here and there. Well, guys, this hour is flying by. Uh, it's been a great discussion happening here on the sidebar here on Blab. I'm uh, just loving reading these comments. I'm just seeing this one by Carissa who says, spend on your needs, not your wants if you want it and it takes a card, you need to not get it. It's not a need. Um, Ginger, just curious, your thoughts on credit cards? Um, I think a lot of people tend to think that well, credit cards are evil. I don't think they're evil. I think if you're able to spend responsibly, I know that a lot of um, personal finance bloggers, they will get different credit cards in order to get the points. Um, I know that there was a time when there were a lot of zero interest um, percentage um, credit cards out there. People were getting them, transferring the balances, actually making money off of them. And so that stopped, I think, not, well, it's, I don't hear much about it in recent years, yeah. but those folks are more responsible than the average person because they have so much credit now available to them, but they're not spending it. Um, so I think if you're, as long as you can be responsible with it, then fine. But if you know that you're not going to be responsible, you know, getting that email from experience saying, hey, your credit score is 500. You don't really want that <laughs> because you can't. <laughs> no, I don't want that at all. No. <laughs> Shouldn't get that letter from us anyway, unless you're subscribing <laughs> to one of our services. Well, so. well, I get alerts. I get alerts if you know if the score is from your lender, maybe not from us. <laughs> unless you're subscribing to Credit Tracker, can we put in a plug? Um, <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I see. I see another comment here from Chris. Uh, credit doesn't make you responsible or more well off. It means you're a borrower and a servant to a lender. If you're carrying a balance. Yeah, if you're carrying a balance. Right. That's right. Well, yeah, I would, you know, I'd stress that. Otherwise, make that lender a servant to you. You know, the, the other thing about credit that people don't think of, it, although not so much right now with the stock market like it is, but businesses do it all the time. If you're able to have savings or investments that are generating 
six or seven or eight percent returns. Maybe you want to use the bank's money, get a loan and pay two or three or four percent interest on their money while you're making eight and you're you're ahead of the game. So it's really a financial tool in that sense, too. You know, but you have to to really be aware of what you're getting. But bank uh, businesses do that all the time. They'll borrow at a lower rate than they can invest and they actually make money using the bank's money. So, you know, that, be aware of that. That's a common strategy. Guys, before we go, I want to ask just a, a final question. And that is just some, for those that are watching here and maybe is an emotional spender, has difficulty uh, controlling their budgets. Um, what advice would you give that person to help them um, overcome this emotional spending? And Ginger, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Um, I would say first admit that you have a problem, right? So I'm a therapist, so of course that's where we often start, which is you have to know that you have a problem in order to really decide that you want to tackle it. Once you know that you have a problem, looking at your triggers and then really building up the restraint. I would never say go cold turkey because you get you'll get resent resentment, you know, resentful. And then you'll say, Well, you know, this doesn't work for me. So I'm gonna just, you know, it's like a slingshot, you pull it all the way back and then it's like you're just gonna go keep on spending. So my advice would be, again, understand your triggers, where they're coming from, um, build up the restraint, start small, um, give yourself an allotted amount that you would be able to spend without consequence weekly, monthly, every paycheck, and then start from there. If you feel that you need to contact a professional like a money coach, not necessarily a financial planner, there's a difference um, that would be able to help you sort through those issues, create a budget. If there are deeper issues involved where you know, you're at, you're pretty much in a battle with your spouse and see a therapist that can help you deal with those deeper issues. Thanks, Ginger. Paul? Uh, my biggest thing is accountability. I'm um, having that person that, that calls you on it when you're, when you're there, um, make sure that you've got somebody in your life that you can talk to about money. Uh, we, we as a society have treated money as this private issue and it, it really shouldn't be. We can learn from each other. We can learn from our family. We can learn from the stakes of others. I'm the youngest child of my family by eight years. Um, the, the information that I've gained by having two siblings that are 10 and eight years older than me is, is a wealth of information. I've gotten to watch them raise children. I've gotten to watch them make mm -hmm. money mistakes and I haven't had to make those same mistakes. They, they did because of them. I've, my life is better. So having, uh, having somebody you can be accountable to and, and somebody that has some more experience is going to make a huge difference. If you're married, obviously that first person is going to be your spouse and uh, set those boundaries in place that really make a difference in, in how you communicate together as well as, you know, how you spend your money together, as opposed to, you know, feeling like you're all alone and working at this alone. You should have that conversation, have that accountability between each other. Thanks, Paul. And Rod? Yeah, I'm kind of building on the same thing. I think that support network is is hugely important. Uh, you know, even things like this, where you get to hear from people who I've learned a lot just sitting listening, and it's and it's inspirational. But honesty, I think, is essential. I mean, just from my personal experience, if you can't have secrets with your spouse about money, um, you know, if you're hiding things you've bought or hiding expenses, it's probably an issue, and it probably goes deeper than money. But um, you know, that's a first source. So you know, be honest, talk about money from a position of, of um, goal setting, not conflict. And it, it goes a lot, a long way. Um, but plan, if you think you've got an emotional, something you want to buy emotionally, one of the things I do is I turn things that could be emotional purchases into sort of a research project because I tend to be the big buyer. My wife buys the little stuff. I decide <laughs> I'm going to spend, you know, 500 or a thousand dollars. And then I go and I start researching whatever it happens to be. And usually by after two or three weeks of that, I kind of go, eh, I just wanted it and it goes away. So, uh, but it's kind of fun to learn about you know things. So it's like, I thought about buying a kayak. I'm still thinking about buying a kayak. <laughs> I've been thinking about it now for three months, so I probably won't do it. Um, but I can tell you all about kayaks because it, I used it to just kind of fun to learn about then instead of spending the money, um, which I could have done and, and would have probably been a foolish thing to do, seeing me in a kayak or trying to stay in a kayak. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, you know, but honesty, I think, is, is most important with yourself and, and, and with you, especially with your spouse, or your partner. Thanks, Rod. I want to thank everyone who's been joining us here on Blab. It's been wonderful reading the dialogue and the sidebar. Before we go, I want to make sure all of our guests can share where you can learn more about them. Ginger, can you share a little bit about yourself and your work you're doing? 
I am a licensed psychotherapist, um, and I'm also the owner of www.girlsjustwanttohavefuns.com. I'll put the link in the sidebar, and that's where we help women go from a hot mess to financial success. Love that. Thank you so much, Ginger. And Paul? Uh, I run, I'm the founder of savingfreak.com. It's where we talk about personal finance, but specifically how to save money on just about anything. Um, so I'm always about strategy when it comes to spending and, and uh, making sure you get the best price on everything as well as spending your money. I also do work in my community through my church where we offer free financial coaching to anybody pretty much in the state of South Carolina. If you could reach one of our 17 campuses, then you can meet with a financial coach for free and uh, sit, sit down and have somebody look at a budget with you. So that's uh, that's New Spring Church that I'm a part of, one of the one of the largest churches in the country, but we, we do a big push on finances and helping people get financially free and making a huge difference in their lives. Thank you, Paul. And Paul and Ginger, can you both put your links in the sidebar so everyone can check out your websites? That'd be wonderful. And Rod? Sure. And I'm Rod Griffin, Director of Public Education with Experience. So, you know, I'm always thankful that Mike has come along and pulled me into the social <laughs> media world because I get to meet so many great people. Um, but uh, you know, and I have probably the best job in the company because I get to talk to people about personal finance and credit reporting and credit scoring. I work with educators and consumers and the media, consumer advocates, uh, and really helping people better understand what we do as a company and how they can be more financially capable, financially successful. A uh, couple of things we're doing now, uh, working on Periscope uh, just about every day at 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern. Uh, I try to be on on Tuesdays and Thursdays and answer credit questions. So ex.pn slash uh, hash slash credit scope uh, to learn more about that. And of course, our tweet chats that uh, Mike started and, and taught this old dog some new tricks and I uh, get to enjoy. So uh, visit experience.com slash education as well. And you can learn more about uh, credit there. Well, Ginger, Paul and Rod, thank you so much for being our guests in this week's credit chat. I want to let all of our viewers know that we're here every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern here on Blab and also on Twitter with the credit chat hashtag. Next week, we're going to be talking about ways to protect your identity this holiday season. So it's going to be a very, very special chat uh, this next Wednesday. I put a, a link in the sidebar for you, to, for you to subscribe. I want to thank you guys all for talking and tweeting with us today. And we look forward to chatting with you all next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ginger. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. Bye, Rod. Take it easy. Bye.